Loosen up, man. Come on, loosen up. Come on, get excited. I okay. want the guy that Hit took me. the beach Bring it. Out. I'll that's tell you want. anything you want to okay, know. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> okay. How does this relate it to that damn buggy of yours? The buggy? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You know, well, the buggy's kind of kind of swoopy and it has a very dynamic line totally to it. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So I'd, I'd say there's, there's a little Kodo in the buggy. Buggy, it's kind of you sit back there, don't you? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, that's more cab central, but what the silhouette of that car in this kind of prominent fender, prominent rear fender. It's kind of cab rearward. Yeah, absolutely. A little bit. We got yeah, that yeah. here, don't we? Oh, we definitely have cab rearward here, yeah. So, absolutely. how did that happen? You know, that's really a result of kind of the clean sheet that we had with this new generation of products. Um, and that's all about the positioning of the motor, the positioning of the driver. From the beginning, we were clear about this vision that we wanted to be more cab rearward. It's a little bit more of a, like a, almost like a, a classic kind of sporty oh, look. Sporty. Yeah, you, you think Morgan, Jaguar, this type of car where you're pulled back a little bit uh, farther and the, the hood is more prominent. So you have a little bit more of that look and feel. So we use that as a basis for the proportional direction for these cars. So true story, when I first started doing the show, good buddy of mine from college comes to me and he says, hey, I'm moving to Portland, I need to get a second car. So he's living in San Francisco, he and his wife shared one car, sadly, a Les Beru. So I suggested to him a car that's fun to drive, that he can get past the wife's budget, and that came up with the Mazda 3. Fast forward four years later, and he loves his Mazda 3, so much so that his nephew calls it the Batmobile. So the Batmobile, it's changed a bit. Instead of having one engine and a Mazda Speed 3, well, I haven't really announced the Mazda Speed 3 yet, but you know it's coming. Anyway, back to the base car. The 2 liter engine puts out about 155 horsepower. Then there's a 2.5 liter engine that puts out about 185 horsepower. Now here's the main difference. It's really the output of the car because the suspension between the two is about the same. The wheels are a bit bigger. They're 18 inches as opposed to 16 inches on the 2 liter. That means you have different tire sizes. And really, when you have the different tire sizes on the bigger wheels, it makes the car feel a little stiffer around corners. Motorman thought I have to stand out here on this dirt road and tell you about head gaskets. So, so here we go. Here's a bunch of head gaskets. Um, what we've got here is a 2.5 liter MZR head gasket and a 2 liter MZR head gasket. Our MZR is Mazda's old engine family. So here's the 2 liter MZR, here's the 2.5 liter MZR, and look at that. Everything lines up, they're completely the same. The only difference is the size of the hole. This is because we made that engine like everybody has made engines since the history of engines. We made a, an engine family where everything's the same size and you just change the bore and the stroke to change the size of the engine. That's common sense, industrial revolution, mass production kind of stuff because the, the machine that makes this engine can also make this engine and we paid, paid a lot of money for that machine and we want to use it as much as possible. So for the Skyactiv-G engine, we have uh, apparently completely lost our minds. 2 liter Sky-G, 2.5 liter Sky-G. Look at that. Nothing lines up at all. They're completely different size engines, which means nothing is interchangeable between these two engines. Uh, I think the rocker arms and a couple of the bolts are the same. Other than that, it's a completely different engine. So why did we do this? Um, we've completely revolutionized our manufacturing process, where now we don't have to rely on these single purpose machines that only do one thing and have to do them a million times. We have a CNC machine that actually has a camera on it and looks at the engine and says, oh, here's a two liter engine, and does all the machining processes for a two liter engine, and sends the engine block off to the next machine, and looks and says, oh, here's a 2.5, and does all those different machining processes, changes its own tools, does all its own stuff. So we're not beholden to our big old machines anymore. We can design an engine more efficiently to be, so the two liter doesn't have to carry around the weight of a 2.5 liter. And that means uh, we can actually focus on how the combustion process happens in the engine and scale the engine up and down proportionally around that combustion process to really make a more efficient engine. I'm a big believer that every car should have a heads-up display. Luckily, Derek and the guys at Mazda seem to agree with me. So when you start up the new Mazda 3, there is a translucent screen that pivots from the top of the dash. And guess what it has? A heads-up display. But no navigation or anything that's extraneous from the driving experience. That is limited to this screen that sits on top of the dash, and that accomplishes two things. It's got all the infotainment stuff, and that's controlled by these two knobs down here. And the knobs are kind of a cross between BMW and Audi in that they got the volume thing down here as well. But the second and more important trick, have you ever been inside of a Mazda 6 or a CX-5? Outside, stunning. The dash on the inside, eh, not so stunning. That's because it's like this big piece of plastic that's right in front of your face. This 
kind of like supermodel sexy. As a result of the cabin being far back, again, we've taken the A-pillar and that windscreen and brought it closer to you in a way, in a little bit more traditional way. So what happens is your visibility out of the car is widened, yeah. right? Because the, the pillars are not obscuring your view. So in the end, it not only looks great, but it enhances your, your safety, your driving experience. Mm, yeah, you see, there's one more little thing that design change affected. Dave? Moto Man wanted me to stand in front of some flaming chairs and talk about exhaust manifolds. So what I want to show you here is this is the exhaust manifold that was on our Skyactiv-G engine when we had it crammed into the second generation Mazda 3, uh, which wasn't designed for that engine. This is sort of your more conventional four into one exhaust manifold. And what you've got here uh, on a four cylinder engine, the firing order is one, three, four, two. Uh, and you have a chance for crosstalk between adjacent cylinders. So cylinder number three, opens its exhaust valve just as cylinder number one is just finishing closing its exhaust valve. There's a little bit of overlap there. Uh, and what that does is it, uh, it makes it harder for it to get all of the exhaust out of the cylinder, which leaving a little bit of hot exhaust in the cylinder raises the temperature, uh, which makes it more likely to knock, which means we had to lower the compression ratio on this version of the engine uh, so it wouldn't knock. So this had a spectacularly high 12 to 1 compression ratio, but the new version of the engine, with the exhaust manifold that we designed it for in the first place, is able to achieve a 13 to 1 compression ratio, the highest of uh, any uh, engine in the world running on the 87 octane gas. And the way we did it was this crazy bundle of snakes, 4 into 2 into 1 exhaust manifold. And the way this manifold works is when that same exhaust valve opens on number 3, uh, the time it takes for that pressure pulse to travel all the way down to this first collector, all the way down to the second collector, and all the way back up to get to number 1, at the speed of sound, that takes long enough. The valve is already closed on number one, and it can't do any harm. It can't shove any exhaust back in there. So the end result is we were able to get the exhaust gas out of the cylinder more effectively, which lowers the temperature on the next cycle, which lets us run higher compression and a better uh, ignition timing. Uh, and in the end, we end up with about 14 foot-pounds more torque in the mid-range uh, with this exhaust manifold than we did with that one. The difference between the 2-liter and the 2.5 is situations like this. I'm on a straightaway, I want to have some fun in the back roads. Okay, so I put my foot into it. The 2-liter, let's just say it's a little flat-footed. You have to work a little harder to get kind of the same power. With a 2.5, you put your foot into it, you got goes. But here's really where things get a little strange. The MPG ratings, I mean, that's kind of what this whole Sky Active thing is about. You lower the weight, give it a little more power, make the car more efficient. It gets the car to be more efficient, meaning using less energy. But for 30 extra horsepower, it's only like one or two MPG lower than the two liter car. So really, what are you gonna get? The 2.5 or the 2.0? You do concept cars to kind of set yourself up for where you want to go in the future, to set goals. And it's not just for the design department and it's not just for PR purposes and for the public, it's for the company as a whole. So our electronics team and the engineering team has some targets to kind of look at. So engineers, not exactly the most creative types in the world, but when you put a challenge or a target in front of them, let's just say the ingenuity of their solutions make the antics of pop star divas look boring. All right, you know those seat heaters and that rear defroster and that thump and stereo that you're enjoying in your car? All that stuff's powered by electricity, and that electricity has to come from somewhere. It comes from your alternator. What spins your alternator? Your engine. So ultimately, we're spending a little bit of fuel to spin that alternator to power all that stuff. We figured that if uh, using our IE loop system, what we do is we only charge that alternator, we only use that alternator to charge the electrical system when you're off the throttle. Because when you're off the throttle, you're not using any gas, but the alternator's still spinning. Um, so to do that, we have to condense all of this charging into some really short bursts of power, which is a big surge of electricity. If you do put that surge of power into a battery over and over again, it will wear out the battery very quickly. So we've put a capacitor in between them. We can surge the power into a capacitor, and then let the capacitor gently charge uh, the battery. Uh, and this can save you up to 5% uh, in your fuel economy. Um, obvious question now is, well, what's a capacitor and why do we put it in there? Well, a capacitor is kind of like a battery in that you can charge it, store electricity in it, and then discharge it. But a battery, if you charge it and discharge it 100,000 times, you'd wear out the battery. From a construction standpoint is that a battery is storing electricity by converting the chemicals back and forth into different states, whereas a, uh, a capacitor is simply taking the, the electricity, the electrons themselves, and putting them on a surface and then letting them come back off that surface. And what we did to, to fit enough charge into this relatively small capacitor is we had to use uh, uh, activated uh, carbon um, 
material that has an immense amount of surface area for, for the amount of uh, mass that it has. And that activated carbon comes from grinding up and, and uh, baking coconuts, actual coconut shells. And with that, I think we've covered everything. Well, with the exception of one very important question for Derek. What are you and I going to do in terms of like seeing this kind of stuff? You, you and I? Of course you and I. You said any time I'm welcome okay. back in the studio. Well then, yeah, well come I'm on by. I'm thinking like some suspension. Um, no, actually, in, in all seriousness, this is a great, a, an amazing base oh, to yeah. do customized stuff. I mean, the car already looks amazing in its stock form, especially with our 18-inch wheels. Mm. But what we've done this time around is we have a full aero kit for this car. So like a spoiler in the front, really? body kit on the, uh, body kit down the side, around the rear, bigger spoiler off the back. We have uh, accessory wheels. We have the 18s come in dark gray. And then we're also gonna be offering Ray's engineering, uh, Volk Racing, four nice. wheels for the car. Okay, so you're, you're welcome to come by. And I'm still gonna come up with my ideas and my graphics. Cause are you sure? Like, we finally do it my way. Hey, it's just tape. It's just you know? tape. <laughs> Stock up on tape. Exactly. Okay, let's get All a right, drink. Bud. Thanks. Okay, so here's the script. For a new Moto Man film every week, click subscribe. And to get a sneak peek of what's coming up on the show, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, Moto Man TV, all one word.